I'm Rachel Romeliotis, a senior editor at O'Reilly, and I'm here at Velocity New York 2013 with Colt McAnlis, a uh, developer advocate at Google. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for joining me. So you have two terms that you've been using, uh, minifaction and compression concerning JavaScript. Can you talk about uh, those and how some people think they're similar, but you actually think they're quite different? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, a lot of people, listen, the, the point is to get the least bits on the wire possible, right? And so we minify our JavaScript and our CSS data so it can come across the wire in the smallest form. But that doesn't mean that it's actually compression. A lot of people use that terminology and say it's compressing. Mm -hmm. These are two very functionally different approaches to a similar problem. Minification is the act of actually reducing content, but it's still structurally able to be parsed by the underlying system, right? So you've removed redundant information, but you can still hand it right off to the JavaScript parser or the CSS parser and just allow it to operate on the data directly. Okay. Compression, on the other hand, is an actual fundamental change in the data stream. We're actually changing the symbol layout, the entropy involved with it. In order for us to hand this back to the underlying processing, we have to reprocess it back into the JavaScript and the CSS that you would normally see. So typically the way you need to look at it is that minification and CSS need to be a one-two punch. Okay. Right? You need to do your minification first and then your compression second. Um, doing one or the other, you're actually kind of shooting yourself in the foot, not getting the full distance you can. Okay. Why do you think people are so confused about those terms? Uh, so, co listen, compression is tough. Compression is a deep, dark art science, right? Like, when you start getting into compression, like, past the standard stuff they teach you in CS102 and stuff like that, you, you pretty much lose your mind. Like, you really, really do. That's okay. why we see most of the advances in compression right now are coming from hardcore computer scientists out mm -hmm. of the European Union, like, uh, you know, uh, Russia and Germany. Those guys are doing amazing stuff because it's so mathematically sound and just very deep information theory principles. You and I can talk about that. That's not web development, right? We, we like really high level approaches and high level solutions to things. And so trying to couple, you know, it, it's easy to put one word on there and just say, we're compressing our JavaScript, when in reality you're minifying your JavaScript and then your server is actually applying GZIP compression later. Wow, okay. So um, another thing that you recently talked about uh, with compression is that uh, PNG compression. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you told uh, people, you gave some tips on your blog, and then at the end you said, um, but you probably recommend <laughs> using WebP image format. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the benefits and when to use that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but first I want to say this is that when, when I, I sit down with a lot of companies and we go through their website performance, the first thing I look at is their images. It, it, bar none, it's the easiest thing to get wrong on every website. And the reason for this is that the people running the analysis on the code, the performance that are testing, you know, how the network is responding, how the layout is occurring, these are the engineers in the pit. These guys are generally working in a vacuum, aside from the vacuum that the design artists are working in. Mm -hmm. right? The designers artists are making their content, they're exporting the images, they're cropping it, they're resizing it, they're trying to get it for all the devices. It's a two separate worlds, and there's very few times these guys are communicating in the right way. Mm -hmm. And when I load up a website and I see a 1.2 megabyte PNG file that doesn't have transparent pixels on it, I know that there's a breakdown in the communication there. And so what I generally try to tell people is, we use PNGs wrongly. We really do. Uh, mm. there, I can I can open up 20 websites right now that are still online, even after I've been ranting about this for a year now, and show you a, you know a 1.5 meg where there's two pixels at the top that are actually transparent because they needed two transparent pixels somewhere in their page. Mm -hmm. um, this can be easily fixed if the designers and the, the engineers would work together to find a design solution that allowed them to use a JPEG variant. Mm -hmm. Now the reason that I suggest using WebP is because it allows you to get the type of compression ratio that you get with JPEG with the lossy systems that you get, or sorry, the alpha transparency that you get with PNG. Mm -hmm. Typically those are the two camps. If you need transparency, you go with PNG. If you need high compression, you go with JPEG. Okay. WebP actually gives you the both of those worlds. So now I know WebP isn't um, used everywhere yet. Is it still safe to incorporate that into your website? Or? I, I think the, the, the keyword yet there, I think, is ideal. Um, because I'm not sure how long that's still going to be a keyword. Okay. Right? WebP is fantastic. When you compare the same amount of peak signal to noise ratio, or PSNR, that's the, how we measure the, the noise introduced in compression mm -hmm. in images. When you compare that against what you get with JPEG, you can hit the same PSNR, but WebP is 30% smaller. Plus, it gives you transparency. I mean, really, this, this file format, besides being magic, right, is kind of the one-stop shop for image compression on the web. Interesting. And if by exporting the stuff, you get 30% savings, I don't know how much longer 
all the other web browsers can kind of hold out and say, no, we're not interested in our websites being 30% smaller to load. That, right, that right, seems right. like a weird conversation to have. Uh, now, I will be honest is that there is some there is some hurdles right now. The technology is still early. We still have to worry about client side scraping and, and how you generate this content on your CDNs and you know detecting that you're Chrome or not Chrome. But you start looking on the web more and more and more, and when you right click your image to save it, Facebook's starting to see it, Google Plus is starting to see it, you're starting to see those web key images, the form, file format starting to show up a lot more. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see this start accumulating on the internet. Okay, Th good to know. So I know you also have a background in online gaming. Yeah. Um, what are sort of the biggest challenges facing that crowd right now as far as like optimization and performance issues? Oh, wow, yeah, that's, uh, that's a tip of an iceberg question. Uh, I'll give you my number one though. Um, so for the longest time, HTML5 game development has kind of been, um, I guess we've kind of catered it in and saying like that it's only JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And I think with the advent of mscripten and portable native client with the new Pepper.js project uh, and other technologies like hacks out there, the language is no longer a problem, right? We have the ability to take C, C++, Objective C, Python, Perl, um, Java, and cross compile all of this to JavaScript to one in the browser now. Mm -hmm. So the problem for game devs is that it's not about the language anymore, it's about the data. Right? We can run the code, we can run it fast, we can run it quickly, but we're still trying to download an 18 megabyte content file to a 4G connection, mm. right? Or to a desktop stack, a web stack that's really not built to allow you to stream right. content at this really fine grain level. I'll, I've said this in, the, in every talk I've given over the past year, it's not about the language anymore, it's about the data. And we're not set up to give game developers what they need to actually handle and cache and store and recompress the data the way they really need to do it for HTML5 gaming to come into the next level. So how do you see that changing in the next few years? Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think we're going to see more movement in this space from mobile pushing on the web stack more than we're going to see it from game dev pushing on the web stack. As, as HTML5 starts continuing its fight against mobile and native and mm. trying to find this medium ground of like, well, we want really rich web, app, web applications that don't require an install, but we also want geolocation and notification pushes and you know native speeds and things along these lines. Also caching of data that's a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. I think the mobile native ecosystem is going to push the web to start adopting more APIs and more standards and more ability to control this stuff more than the HTML5 game developers are. For a lot of the time when we, when we get bug reports from HTML5 game devs, you know, they're, they're really tough to prioritize high because it's affecting, you know, 800,000, 900,000 users on a daily mm -hmm. basis where we have to, you know, weigh that against a bug we might get from a, a very large social website. Right, right. Well, all interesting stuff. Thank you for joining <laughs> me you, and sure. uh, have a great velocity. Hey, thanks so much.